Hi, I'm Whitney Tilson of T2 Partners. My partner Glenn Tung and I have been doing a great deal of work on the mortgage crisis in the United States and today, December 11th, 2008, I'd like to share a little bit of that work with you. This chart shows the historical relationship over time between household income, the blue bar down here of the average American household, and the amount of money that the average American was able to borrow to buy a house. And what we can see is, is that going back into the 1990s and in fact decades earlier, the traditional relationship was that uh, the, uh, uh, someone could borrow roughly three times their income. So if they had $30,000 of income, if they could document that income, make a down payment, um, they could then, and, and had a good credit score, they could then borrow roughly $90,000 to purchase a house. Um, that historical relationship began to uncouple starting in the early part of this decade. And as you can see, while household income stayed relatively flat, the amount of money that, um, that the average American could borrow against that income uh, rose to a, a historical relationship of three times up to a peak of nine times uh, the average person's income. So what was driving that? Uh, there were a number of factors. Interest rates went down a little bit. Um, you didn't have to make any down payments in many cases. Um, there were, um, uh, you, uh, you could do interest only mortgages, which um, as opposed to fully amortizing ones where you're paying down principal. But the single biggest driver is, is that lenders historically would, uh, were willing to lend something in the range of uh, one third of someone's income um, that would go toward uh, mortgage payments. And at the peak of the bubble, they were willing to lend 60% of the average person's income. And of course, uh, that will uh, have an enormous impact on the amount of money that can be borrowed to, to buy a house. So um, over time, this chart takes us back to the end of World War II. You can see that mortgage debt relative to equity, um, uh, American homeowners at the end of World War II had $97.5 billion of equity and only $18.6 billion of debt on their homes. And you can see that over the past uh, half century that that ratio has declined and declined and declined until just uh, in the past couple of years, for the first time ever, Americans owe more on their homes than they have equity in their homes. And the, num the numbers have ballooned as well. Mortgage debt uh, as of 2007 was 10.5 trillion, the equity was 9.6 trillion. So this has grown to be an enormous, enormous market. And by the way, the mortgage market today is north of about 12 trillion dollars. So what, uh, what were some of the factors that drove the bubble? Well, first of all, uh, lenders back in 2001, the combined loan to value was 79.8. In other words, the average borrower had to put down 20% when they were buying a home. Over time, you could see that the loan to value rose up till uh, in 2006 when it rose to 89.1%, meaning the average borrower, instead of having to put down 20% to buy a home, only had to put down 11%. Um, the number of cases in which you had 100% financings, in other words, the, the homeowner didn't have to put down a penny to own the home, was almost uh, never happened. Um, it, it was as low as 3% in the early part of this decade. By the peak of the bubble, it was north of a third of all mortgages made in this country. The borrower put no money down. Um, this chart shows the, the increase in uh, limited documentation or stated income loans. Um, and you can see that this rose from 27% up to 44% of all mortgages. Um, these are so-called liar's loans. And finally, the most toxic combination in a mortgage is 100% financing and low or no documentation. And that was only 1% of loans back in 2001, rose to 15%, about one out of every seven loans in the country was made where the borrower put no money down and didn't verify um, their, their income or assets. So uh, let's start and take a look at subprime. Uh, subprime mortgage origination was very small back in the 1990s. Less than 1% of all mortgages originated were to people with very troubled credit histories and, and poor uh, what are called FICO scores. Um, and you can see it skyrocketed um, starting in 2003, 2004, peaked in 05, 06, and early 07. Um, $600 billion a year at the peak, but still it was only 13.6% of all mortgages written at the peak. So subprime has been widely blamed for uh, causing the entire mortgage mess, but in fact was only a relatively small piece of it, albeit a very poorly performing piece of it. So this chart sort of puts into context subprime with all of the other types of loans uh, that, that are made, 
including outside the housing market, the largest pieces of it are prime mortgages, standard mortgages. Here are agency mortgage-backed securities. Both of those are about four and a half trillion dollars of outstanding debt today. Um, commercial real estate leverage loans, jumbo loans, so-called loans that are uh, large loans that are too large to where the government won't guarantee them. Home equity, HELOCs, uh, so-called HELOCs, credit cards, high-yield corporate bonds, so-called junk bonds, automobile loans, Alt-A loans, commercial and industrial. And you see, subprime is only about $700 million outstanding today. Most of the loans paid at, back at the peak of the bubble have either defaulted or they've refinanced. So the, the, the total dollar amount of subprime loans outstanding is actually only a small piece of an enormous, enormous uh, debt, uh, amount of debt that's out there. And if you know anything about these other debt classes, uh, you'll realize that the, the problem that we face as a nation is far, far bigger than a subprime problem. So this shows uh, home prices going back to 1975. You can see they sort of fluctuated, but there was a trend line in here. And starting in about 2000, we started to go way, way, way above trend line. Well, not surprisingly, in about 2000, if you recall the first chart I showed, the amount of money that a homeowner could borrow against their mortgage uh, started to skyrocket. Well, if a whole lot of money is chasing a relatively fixed asset class, not surprisingly, prices are going to go up in that asset class. And that's, in fact, exactly what we saw. Home prices rose far, far, far above trend line uh, starting at the beginning of this decade. So what caused the great mortgage bubble? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Um, I cover some of them here, but there were two fundamental reasons. People, banks and lenders were making bad loans uh, to people who shouldn't have been getting these loans. And so the question is, well, why would a rational, presumably rational bank or lender do that? And the answer, I think, is twofold. When, when someone makes a loan, they're going to do one of two things with it. They're either going to keep it on their own books, or they're going to sell it to somebody else, uh, send it to Wall Street to get securitized and sliced and diced. Well, if you're going to do the latter, if you're going to send the loan to somebody else, then you don't really care if the loan defaults um, because someone else is going to bear the loss. All you're acting is, is as an agent, you get paid a fee for originating the loan and then you shoot it along to somebody else. Wall Street didn't care because they bundled these loans into pools, as we'll discuss in a future segment, sliced and diced them, sold the, sold the pieces of those pools off to investors around the world. So throughout that entire chain, nobody cared uh, about whether the loans defaulted because they didn't think they'd get stuck with the losses. They were just passing them along, selling them to somebody else. Okay, now what about the people who were making loans who kept them on their own books? Surely they would care if, if a loan defaulted, but in fact, um, because home prices were rising so rapidly, let me turn to uh, this chart. And what, sh what it shows is, is on this axis of the chart, it shows how much you lose in the event of a default. And over here, it shows home price appreciation. And so what you can see is, is the downward slope here of the line means that as home prices are rising rapidly, here's 10% and up. When someone defaults on the loan, there's almost no loss to the lender because all they do is go in, foreclose on the house, and they have an asset that is now worth a lot more than the value of the loan. And even with the cost of foreclosure and so forth, they can sell that asset um, and, and lose very little money, sometimes even make a little bit of a profit. So this chart is, shows what happens to a pool of subprime mortgages at different home price points. And the chart's inverted from the last one, where here's high home price appreciation. And then as home prices go to flat and start declining, here are the losses that one would expect to see in a pool of subprime mortgages. And what you can see is, is when losses in June of 06 were less than one percentage point, uh, well, that's what happens when you have home price appreciation of about 12%. But as home price appreciation becomes zero, losses in the pool go up to 7%. And then if you start seeing negative numbers, the losses in the pool accelerate. Because now when someone defaults, you own a house, you not only have all the costs of foreclosure and so forth, um, but you also now have a, a, an asset that's worth less than, than what you paid for it. So the losses uh, start to accelerate dramatically. But that wasn't the assumption that people were making when they were writing these loans. Uh, because for since the Great Depression, home prices had done nothing but go up in America. So people, as they are often want to, is they, assume, they just projected the immediate past and definitely into the future. So even if you were planning on holding the loan, you didn't care if the homeowner defaulted. So I'll, uh, in the next segment, I will come back and talk about, well, what's happening now? What are the consequences of the bursting of this bubble?